got several companies we own, uh, construction, five guys, Costa Vida, we just started that, real estate development. We've got 28 five guys as of two weeks from now. We'll be opening our 28th. We just opened our first uh, Costa Vida in Oklahoma. We have five guys in four states, Utah, Idaho, California, Oklahoma. And we have uh, buildings that we own mainly in Utah. We do have one in Idaho. We brought in five guys so that we could put them in our own buildings and then uh, build that same building a lot. Out of our 28, five guys, one is in our own building. So it didn't work out that um, I'm going to ask you uh, a few questions about leadership, just kind of your idea on this. And I gave you that sheet before, um, and so I've switched these questions around a little bit more of what I feel I, I want to ask first and then get into it, but they are what you've seen. So to start off, leading and managing are not the same, according to many people. Uh, what are the differences, and uh, why is leading, leadership and management different? <clears throat> I think some look at it as just a semantical issue, meaning they're interchangeable. My thought is more, you know, leading has more of a passionate component uh, or active component. Managing, uh, we have people that can manage a project very well. They couldn't have come up with a project. You know, a leader might, they have the vision, they've got the foresight and can get you there and then sometimes and we do this too say okay now run this hopefully good leaders are good managers also but I think they can be bifurcated and and uh, that's how I would define it the one is more yeah. future looking more vision more uh, kind of like what you were saying earlier about um, hiring the right person to do the, that management when you're talking about the other roles um, kind of the right person on the bus concept yeah. You know, getting the right people in place so you can let them do what they were hired for. Yeah. Yeah, you do. In fact, uh, you know, eventually we're going to have a couple hundred restaurants. At a certain point, we want to have 200 very happy general managers in our store. doesn't mean they're not good leaders, too, because they have to lead their employees in that store. But <clears throat> they have a specific goal and task. Obviously, there are many types of leaders. Like you're saying, you're, you've got the vision and you've got your managers who are also leaders of their groups. Um, but more task oriented. Uh, what type of person do you look at uh, that has a capacity to lead? I think anyone can lead if they have one characteristic, which is character, frankly, good character. But also, it's, it's really an inner uh, confidence that on, a, on principles. I don't think you can lead if uh, people don't trust, if they don't trust you and trust that you're sincere. And so, I think there are many different leadership um, types as there are people. I really do. You can have a wonderful leader who's very quiet and introverted, but he's solid and um, knows where, I mean, take a CEO of an accounting firm. Uh, you know, accountants typically, and this is a major generalization, have a certain, you know, uh, very organized, demeanor, sometimes they're like, oh, bookwormish a little bit, and I know a lot that aren't, so that'd be to be offensive, but, but, you know, you can lead a major accounting firm without being hyper-dynamic, really, but if you have a good vision, people trust you, you have strong character, you're gonna, they're going to want to uh, follow you and do what you need them to do, and so I think as many, and then you could have the Donald Trump's, you know, type who are, you know, pretty, uh, extroverted, like the attention, you know, on the other end of the mm -hmm. spectrum. Uh, I don't really know if he's a good leader or not. He's a wealthy guy, but I don't know if he's a good leader. But, um, well, it's interesting you say that, and, and I like it, about having the integrity, um, the trust factor, uh, somebody that's got character um, that you can get behind. One of the books we just finished reading was uh, How to Manage in a, in a Flat World. Um, and it's funny, it's how to manage in a flat world, but it's all about leadership and it's international business. And out of all the, I mean, there are 60 different firms that they interviewed. And all of them had the same um, one underlying principle of trust, mm -hmm. which is what is the most effective. You have to, you have to, the leader has to be <clears throat> believed, first of all, and believable. There's some, I mean, people would say Lee Iacocca, remember Lee Iacocca, you know, head of Chrysler. 
And what happened was, when he was there, it was fantastic. I mean, growth and, and you know, financial profits and so forth. When he left, it crumbled. And the reason was, I don't know, I wouldn't put him in the great leadership category only because it wasn't sustainable. He did it by sheer will and sheer force. And by, you know, people were scared of him, frankly. And, hey, while well, you do this or you're fired type of thing. Um, and uh, is that leadership or is that tyranny, you know? And, and, and so, right. um, and look, he probably has some good qualities. I've never met him personally. But that's just the appearance where, boy, if he's there, you know he could get it done. But people probably hated every minute of it. And then, again, when he left, he hadn't surrounded himself with people of the same vision and a continuing vision, and so it tended to not work. If you get good, strong character, and, uh, and look, you have leaders that can lead people to do terrible things like Hitler, right? He had a uh, vision, and he really believed what he was doing, and he brought people to that same place, and it was a bad place. So you can have leaders that have, you know, effectively poor character, right. uh, but are, you know, but they're committed, and they can bring people there. So I guess you do have that side of it too. But they still have the same, you know, but they're sincere in their beliefs. Yes. Right. And he was sincere in a bad way. The leaders are often synonymous with being true to themselves. Um, why is that? It's it's the only way to lead, or no, or no one will follow. If you have some great idea. Uh, let's just say it's a new invention, uh-huh. and somebody asks you a question that might, um, you know, let's say you're with all your employees and somebody asks a question, well, does it really work? And you say, well, I think so. <laughs> let's give it a shot. Well, who's really, you don't have that conviction. You don't believe yeah, it. Yeah, yourself. Yeah, and, and, and unless you really are a believer, sincerely, people can see through it. Insincerity is, is one of the easiest things to <clears throat> note in somebody. And so um, you, just, you just need to, and, and it's not a false, yeah, we can get it going. Because look, sometimes there is some hope behind it. every business we have. We're a believer in it, but then at the same time, think, I hope this works. You know, we got to get this thing to work. But a true believer will rally the troops, you know, and say, this is our vision. This is what we want to do. Let's go get it done. And if you get people on the same page, wonderful things can happen. But What's your experience with uh, leading different genders, and do you see certain capabilities in one compared to the other? Um, yeah. um, look, I have five daughters and a son, and I'll start there, and totally different, totally different. Um, at the same time, each individual is totally different. And so, uh, you know, there are people that have uh, traits that would be more generalized to uh, women or to men. So it's best to look at individuals and what they, some respond to a kick in the pants and some respond to the arm around the shoulder and saying, you know, come on, what can, you know, what do you think you can do better? You do have to look at it individually. We've got, um, like I said, about 700 employees and we spend a lot of time on, in fact, leadership, we have a whole management handbook that we put together with a section on that on leadership and part of that is you got to know your people, and you have to know what motivates each one. You just can't come into a, a, a restaurant with 30 employees and say, um, and just treat them all, uh, or, or try to motivate them all the same way, because it doesn't work. Um, you can have goals. You can say, this is our goal, this is what we're trying to get to. Mm-hmm. Here's the strategy to get there. But some do need the competition and some don't do well in the competition. And that's male or female. It's male or female. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, some colleges or pro teams have quarterback controversies and, you know, hey, we have these two, we don't know who's going to start, and we're going to have these major competitions. <coughs> what you find is some thrive under that. Some <coughs> thrive more when they've got the position they can settle in and relax and do their job. And you have to know, you know, if you're a coach, you better know which one works best for your players. Um, you know, there are certain things that I don't tolerate. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't ever let our people threaten somebody, do this or you're fired. We've had some people who've done that and we've talked to them and they keep doing it and they've said, just time to go find something else. This isn't for you. We don't function that way. 
because it gets the results short term and everybody hates that manager. Yeah. You know, they'll do it because they're doing it out of fear. And so there's certain things that it might work. They get the results, but nobody's happy. Is uh, competition healthy in the workplace? Is incentivization? Um, where do you draw the line where it's where it can be abusive and where it can be healthy? I guess. Yeah, I think you need to set a minimum threshold. Look, we 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 have to meet this threshold. You know, we joke this is not a hobby for us. We're in business to make money, uh, and so in business. You know, your scorecard is your balance sheet. If you're a doctor, your scorecard could be, you know, how many successful heart transplants have I done, or how many lives have I saved, or how many, you know, whatever. You know, every industry has its own uh, uh, measure of success. Mm -hmm. In business, it is your balance sheet. And so, yeah, you need to have a minimum. We need to be profitable. It, you know, you can't go around a store for us and be the nicest <coughs> person and lose money every month and expect to have your job. So there are minimum re, uh, requirements that we expect. That being said, um, yeah, I think it's okay to have some competition as long as it doesn't cause bad practices, meaning you want to set up a situation where if you do well, it's not at the expense of somebody else. If you do that, now you're encouraging uh, non-help between the two uh, groups, because if you help them and they do well, then it hurts you. That's a bad structure for competition. So I think uh, competition is great as long as you reward those that hit their goals, not at the expense of somebody else. Are leaders born, self-made, or both? Uh, I think as long as people have good, strong character, it can be both. Uh, I have learned a lot from different people and how they do it just by watching and um, have taken, I don't know if it's been o overtly trying to study it, but just with exposure to say, wow, you know, that works, that's a great trait, I'd like to emulate that. Um, so, so I think you can create that, but uh, it's, it's a bit hard to instill principles into people. Uh, and so if they don't have those, I, you know, th that's the hard jump to make to say, you'd be a great leader. Um, Again, there's a lot of short-term successes mm -hmm. where people can pretend uh, it's a bit of a show. Right. And, you know, people might say, what a great leader. Well, all of a sudden, um, you know, some character flaws that are, might be brightly shining, shine through, and, and everyone all of a sudden says, what were we thinking? I can't believe we thought he, he or she was a good leader. Yeah. So I think they can be, you know, a lot is innate. You know, growing up in households with strong principles and good teachings, and all of a sudden, is once you have those, again, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, introvert, extrovert, whatever. People will be drawn to. I have a daughter who is the quietest thing. She is a sweetheart, uh, very solid, but really doesn't say a lot. And have these friends that just gravitate toward her, and. Uh, it's really amazing to see because quiet leadership. she just does it quietly, you know, and they just, they do, they gravitate toward her, they want to do what she does, and just a quiet leader. Well, bringing in the family aspect, um, tell me about your siblings and parents and how their personalities and their traits have helped mold your leadership style. I have, there are six siblings, I mean total, I have two brothers and three sisters, uh, and it goes sister, sister, brother, then me and then a little sister and a little brother. Then we're all different. Um, my, and then my father and mother um, are still back in Connecticut. And, and they're different. My mother is real, um, just a solid, quiet rock. And her leadership skills have been like, summed up in really kind of one phrase, which is, you know, just love them. And that's referring to kids specifically for her, because we never ask, because all of her, we all, we turned out okay. You know, no one's in jail, whatever. Um, uh, and she would just say, look, don't worry, just love your kids. If they know you love them, you know, that's the key. But she takes that to, um, I'll give you an example. She and my father had donated a building at Harvard Business School. A lot of money, 
uh, donated there. And normally, when they do the, you know, when they cut the ribbon for the building, I've seen a lot of people say, "Oh, we're so happy we can give this." It's you know, it's all about them. You know, yeah. my mother spent 20 minutes in her speech there, thanking the architects and the builders and the teachers and the students and everyone that was going to learn in that facility. Um, the comments I got after, uh, and that even were written, was, we've never had this experience. You know, what a wonderful woman. She just, and you know, they just loved her because she was just so appreciative of the help. Of the, you know, all they did in their mind was, okay, here's, here's, the here's some money. You know, and we're here to help, and they had gone there for business school. Um, and, uh, you know, and they had a vision. You know, they wanted to, and, and my dad's vision on that was, look, if we, you know, if you just give money to everybody, it's gone soon. But in this case, hey, we'll go put, you know, seven figures in this building and leverage the students. They're going to learn here. They're going to go around the world. We would like them to take these principles of caring for people with the education and really build a, a, a strong force around the world. And so, you know, take a little bit of what you have and leverage, because you can either leverage money or people or time. Those are mm -hmm. the three things you can leverage, right? And in this case, they leverage money and people and the people's time. Only success will be, you know, I mean, how do you run 700 people, which isn't cute. I mean, some people have thousands and thousands. We'll get there eventually. We have to mm -hmm. open another 170 stores. But you just gotta care about your people. It can't be about what's best for you. And that's kind of where I go back to like an Ivan Coke. And I don't want to pick on him or some of these other people where it's all about them. Hey, I want the spotlight, this is key. And I joked, I think it was off camera, if you ever see me cooking in a restaurant, run. Yeah. Right? I'm not the best cook. You don't want to see me. We have everyone in our restaurants are key are just key to that, or in our construction company, I can't go build a building. You know, I know the principles of business, but I can't go build a building, I can't go run a restaurant. Um, and so you have to respect people's talents, and then you better care about them. Or, or what happens is they just start exchanging time for money, fine, I'm going to work, or work my eight hours, and I'm going home. I hate those guys. Then you have no loyalty, you've got no real strong business. So how important is communication? Uh, for you and how do you live that? I mean, obviously 700 people, that's hard to get to know each of them on an individual basis, but how do you communicate? How do you put your face out? Yeah, there? it is. I just was in Oklahoma last week, mm -hmm. went to all of our stores, worked in our stores with our people. Uh, uh, it is hard to know everybody because we do have a lot of high school and college kids that will kind of be part-time and turn, you know, churn through there. But our GMs and our assistants are pretty solid. And so uh, we try to know all of them. Uh, and not just know them, but like I said, I wouldn't just would work a lunch rush. All I'm confident in doing there is I clean the dining room. Uh, it does two things, so it tells the people in the restaurants that, because, you know, the coveted jobs are more, um, you know, making the food and so forth, because oh, anybody can go clean. Well, no, that's not how I feel about it. What I keep telling our people is that's the critical job in our company, because that's the job when you're out with the customers in the dining room. Did they get the right food? Are they happy? So forth. So they have to communicate. And so by going to work those lunch or dinner rushes mm -hmm. in restaurants, I'm trying to demonstrate this is a critical position. It's all about communication. It's all about their caring for people. In fact, I'll take a step back. The key to any successful business, you've got to hire the right people for the job. And depending on what your business is, that might be a different person. For us, we try to hire for leadership, interestingly. People who have a vision that we don't want the people just exchanging time for money because they're not going to be happy with the customers. Uh, you know, if somebody says, hey, I got mushrooms. I didn't want mushrooms. If somebody doesn't care, they go, ah, fine, I'll fix that for you. Or, gee, you, you ordered wrong. Yeah. You going to blame the customer? No. And so you have to have people, again, who are confident enough and who care enough to say, sorry, my fault, let me take care of that for you. And uh, this, it's very hard to train. We have tried to train the wrong people to do that, and they can't ever get there. It's not innate. And so, you know, say, look. So that comes good. back to 
some of those things you're born with, I guess. Yeah, you yeah. Learn how you, up. yeah growing up, how you were trained, uh, mm-hmm. do you really care for people, or are you self-focused? Uh, selfish people don't do well with us because it's not about us, it's always about who we're doing things for. Right. So. so what was some of the best advice that you've received from a mentor or a friend on leadership? Well, I would say my mother's because I quote it often, which is just love them. We try to do that to our families. Um, and the other one is share, which I get uh, from my dad. He started, I'll give an example, he started a business uh, called Life Re. It was the largest reinsurance company in the in probably in the world, uh, which was basically the insurance company for the insurance companies for life. So if you get an all-state policy, life policy, they don't hold that. They'll then sell part of that, so they don't hold all the risk to a reinsurer. So he did that. Okay. But anyway, the fact of the matter is, what he did was um, he gave everybody uh, down to the you know, mail clerk, shares in the company. And they eventually went public and sold, um, uh, well, they went public and ran it for a while, then they sold it to the Swiss. (coughs) And a lot of millionaires, a lot of hundreds of thousandaires, that's a term, uh, everyone was very wealthy. But what happened was they had ownership. And he said, even the people said, well, instead of throwing that stationary away, we could cut it and glue the ends and we have no pads. And it saved $10,000 a year, whatever it was. But everyone started to look at things. They had ownership in this. They, you know, they were going to benefit from it. And they started to care more than just being an employee. We've done, we have a different company that is not structured that way, but we try to share. Mm-hmm. And so look, if you do well, you're compensated for it. We value your opinion. We just had, uh, as an example, we just brought in some of our best GMs uh, and, not, and some of our area guys and said, look, we need to figure out a way to more efficiently, you know, basically cut some food costs because to the customer, everything for us is fresh and high quality. Um, and so it's a, it's a little more expensive than going to McDonald's. Yeah. We can't do it. We, we have to maintain quality. That's really what we're selling. What can we do then to, uh, on our side, to make sure that there's some money left at the end of the day? We brought them in, sat them down, and said, look, for two days, let's go through this. How do you slice tomatoes? Is there a better way to slice tomatoes? You know, all these different things. They came up with all of these ideas, which we then aggregated and put into, which is going to be added to our manager handbook. In fact, it just was, just this week. And it's going out. They have ownership in this thing. They're now going out to train. They'll get compensated for it as they succeed in implementing this thing. And they're excited. This is, the, this is their idea. They're doing it. They're, you know, all we did was facilitate and say, mm-hmm. here's our goal. Here's our, mm-hmm. you know, the principle behind this. This is why we need help. We don't have all the answers. You, you do. Look, uh, we talk about hiring the right people. I've made some of the worst hires in our company because when I hire someone for a director of ops position or something and they don't work out, and we've had one that was a f- huge failure, do I blame him? No, it was my hire. I mean, you know, uh, he fooled me for a little bit, but he was the wrong hire. And he was the one who was threatening and doing, you know, things mm-hmm. like, do this or you're fired type thing. Again, doesn't work very well. Had a lot of discussions. But I raised my hand and said, guys, as, a, as GMs or area directors, you need to hire the right people. You know I've messed up. You saw, because this guy was over then. You saw what happens. I apologize for that. We're now hiring, you know. In fact, I took that role over for a while. I just said, I'll do it, direct, you know. And uh, now my, uh, I have a brother now who's running all of ops. But the point is, you have to take personal responsibility for your failures. Because then people will say, you know, they see through. If I blame that guy, they would say, well, behind me, this guy hired him. I mean, what do you know? So you have to do that. But when you give them the principles you're trying to accomplish and say, Look, uh, go do it. They'll thrive. The other thing we learned is, I, I don't care about mistakes. I care about how you fix the mistake. Let's assume I make you a wrong burger, and you and you're mad. And although it seems like a little thing, you've paid for that, right? You pay five dollars for this thing, and you're a little grumpy, and you had this lunch break, and you want it to be great. If I solve that in the right way, 
and take it. I am so sorry we did that. You know what? Keep that one. Let me make you another one. What end up, ends up happening is you're going to say, wow, this is great. I did not have got loyalty from you because I've taken care, I've admitted the problem and I've taken care of you mm -hmm. and you feel satisfied now. And so mistakes allow us to, to breed very loyal customers. It also does with employees. I had one guy who made a mistake, probably should have been fired for it, and I sat him down and I said, uh, you know, that wasn't right. And we walked through this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And he promised it would never happen again. And I believed him. And so uh, we, we had to demote him a little bit to demonstrate we understood, and there's a penalty for that. But he just got re-promoted to a GM. We'll have this guy for life because he, he understands, we, you know, that he had a problem, but he fixed it, and that we allowed him to, you know. Yeah, and that, this goes right along with one of the questions I had about what separates a mistake from a failure. And I mean, it was welcoming, but is the failure kind of the recurrence of mistakes? Yeah, I think failure is you stop, you quit. That's how I look at a failure. Failure is, a, uh, is in my mind, when you say that word, it's, it's over, it's final. One of the last questions I had, uh, is more personal. Um, uh, tell me kind of what some of your dreams were when you were younger and have you accomplished that? And what have you not accomplished that you still want to accomplish? A unique upbringing. I grew up in a little town in Connecticut. Um, and my dad worked in the town. He did travel quite a bit, but mainly day trips. And he was doing these deals with insurance companies. But I always wanted to be like him in, in the regard that I had no idea how successful it was when I was little, um, or not, but he turned out to be a successful businessman. But what I wanted to be like him was, he went to all of our games. He went to, you know, and he, he had all these kids. I had, at one point, we did move to Tampa, Florida for a couple of years when I was in junior high. 31 junior high basketball games around Central Florida. He went to every single one of them. And... There's always five people in the stands. That That's was about six, it. Six siblings. Yeah, and he was always the one, and the other ones always changed. He was the one that was always there. Once he was late, and being a 13-year-old, I said, and I told my mom, I said, geez, mom, he was late, what happened? Well, he had to like cancel a board meeting, charter a plane, and get there, because there was some problem to get there. So here's a guy who, it was critical, the family was critical to him. And so... Uh, when I was coming out of business school, uh, I had, uh, it was interesting, and I won't take a lot of time, but I had one class that was probably the most influential, and it was even just an hour of the entire semester. They brought in a guy and he said, close your eyes. I'm going to walk you through a day in your uh, life. You're waking up. What are you putting on? Are you putting on casual clothes, a suit, whatever? You're going outside. Are you getting in a car? Are you getting in the subway? You know, how are you getting to work? Where are you going? And he walked through all of those types of things. And, um, and so I had my vision of what that was. But what it came down to for me is I realized I wanted flexibility like my father. And so I didn't really care. I actually kind of pictured, this is funny because I was from Connecticut, picturing mountains and almost Sun Valley. I'll be in Sun Valley and I'll whatever, go home for lunch and barbecue or whatever. But what it really was was flexibility. And so my dream for business, even this, is create something that allows me to be flexible, which I can. I have to run to a little school performance for a preschooler in the middle of the day. I can go. And, um, and that's what I've always based any business decision on, which is I will forego money at a drop of a hat uh, if by taking that, it locks me in and I can't have that flexibility. I mean, success to me is being able to go out to eat without worrying about what the bill is, or being able to go on a vacation without worrying too much about the, the bill. I don't need 12 homes, four boats, you know, whatever. And so, pretty simple in that regard. Uh, uh, but I, absolutely, with our six kids, and let me tell you, it's hard to be, and sometimes I miss, I'm not as good as my father on that, because we actually have several hundred employees, and when they call, they're family. If they have a problem, they have a death, divorce, whatever the problem is, a sick child, you know, we try to allow them to have that say, fine, go. That's important. That's we'll cover it somehow. Don't worry about it. 
Uh, so we've tried to implement that down to all of our employees, even the you know minimum wage hourly person. They have a problem fine. You, you're not going to lose your job. Take care of it. And so that's kind of the guiding principle for me. Wouldn't be for everybody. Some people are like, I'm going to make as much money and retire at 40, and then do those things. You know. Yeah. But anyway, that's my perspective.